And we are live on the Two Turtle Tom live show every Thursday night, 8 p.m. Eastern Time. I'm Tom, and tonight we've got Phil Simpson. We're going to talk turtles. We're going to hang out. We'll take your questions. Do you have a pet turtle? Uh, tell us about your turtle. Um, and then let us know who you are in the chat. And uh, so far we've got Dragon Lair is here. Um, hey, Patrick, how's it going? And we've got Patrick Lee uh, joining us. So, yeah, if you're new here, let us know. Introduce yourself. Um, we really, really are happy that you're here. Uh, we are just a bunch of turtle nerds. We do this every Thursday night at, excuse me, 8 p.m. And uh, so Wes Coleman is here tonight. Hey, Wes, how are you doing? Um, I, I saw on social that you uh, kind of doubled down on the Chinese box turtles. So that's pretty cool. Um, really focusing on one species. So. And that is a, a species, Phil Simpson, that I think, if I remember correctly, you have some Chinese box turtles. I do, yes. Awesome. So, well, Phil, let's uh, let's kind of catch up. Um, what's uh, what's going on in your turtle world, in your turtle room? Well, you know, uh, it's that time of year. Turtles are waking up. You know, their appetites are increasing. Uh, weeds outside are starting to sprout, and so there's a lot of opportunity to get some wild browse out there. And yep. Just enjoying having everybody awake again. Yeah. Yeah, totally. How do you hibernate? Like, what uh, are are they in a garage or in your house? Do you do a refrigerator? I have a, a a couple of methods. Uh, I have a screened in porch that I use. Um, you know, the last like you know ten years ago here in Virginia, I couldn't have done that. It was just too cold. Uh -huh. But the last three or four years, our winters have just been very mild, and there's only been a few nights where. You know, if it was going down into the 20s or the teens, I'd have to bring them in off the porch and bring them inside so they don't get too cold. Uh, so that's worked out pretty well. And then I've also uh, been using a, a basement room. It's, uh, non, it's not non-heated, doesn't have any air ducts going in there. So, uh, again, it worked better a few years ago than it has the last few years with these warm winters. But it still at least gives me a chance to, you know, get some turtles out there and let them experience experience some cooler temperatures mm -hmm. yeah very cool so you, you said that you like to feed your turtles and tortoises with the outdoor weeds and stuff like that so you know you see that all over the facebook uh, world people will talk about getting weeds for their tur turtles and tortoises and they often don't like say what to get they'll just say feed your tortoises weeds um, I'm curious, what in your area, you're in Virginia, like, what are you looking for? Are you looking for certain plants? Um, what do you look for? And yeah, how do you decide what to pick? Uh, well, I use um, a couple of sources for deciding what to look for. Um, the tortoise uh, table is dot com is a pretty good source. And I also rely a lot on uh, Katrina Smith, who's our uh, the options manager for the Mid-Atlantic Turtle and Tortoise Society. She's always posting um, pictures of different plants that are, are coming up and are safe to feed to tortoises and turtles. And uh, so far this year, uh, a couple weeks ago, the deadheaded or purple, oh, I'm getting Pur wrong. Purple, purple dead nettle. Dead nettle, thank you. Lamium purpureum. <laughs> oh, the scientific, or the, the scientific name, love it. Yeah. I'm the Bonnie geek. So that, that came up a couple of weeks ago. So I've been harvesting that. I even okay. have a neighbor who helps. <laughs> so that, that plant is in the mint family. Okay. Um, how do the tortoises and turtles like it? They aren't crazy about it. Okay. There are some who will nibble at it and uh -huh. some will even eat it wholeheartedly. But I would say the majority of them don't love it. Okay. Because I've, I've wondered about that plant. I haven't used it uh mike chan says hi um hey mike welcome um it's it's an annual so like it, it really has a flush of growth at this time of year 
And it seems to be coming like a worse weed. I, I remember like all, all of a sudden, just one time, one spring, it, hit, it seemed to like take over an entire flower bed. I'm like, how did this happen? But it, there's a ton of it. If you, if you have it, you'll often get a ton of it. So I could really see where it'd be a great early spring food to harvest. But it's in the mint family. The mint family, they have a lot of like secondary compounds, you know, like spearmint and and you know that imparts an interesting flavor so i've never tried it but i've never tried it either <laughs> yeah but some of the turtles like it so i mean does it what is do you try to pick as many things as you can or give them whatever is available and if they eat some that's great if they don't absolutely yeah yeah Variety is the key, you know, during the winter time, I rely a lot on the grocery stores, uh, for endive or, um, uh, green leaf lettuce, red leaf lettuces, that kind of thing. Um, you can even get uh, dandelion in the grocery stores these days. Yes. And, uh, yeah. that's also yeah. another thing that's available outdoors right now. The dandelions in my area are blooming and I haven't met a tortoise yet that doesn't love a dandelion flower. Yeah. My hinchbacks love, you know what they really love on the dandelions? They like the stems for whatever reason. Um, they, I, I grow the dandelions in their enclosure and they're, they're a little bit red, but not bright red, but for whatever reason, they just loved the stems and they would go around and I would watch them. The Western hinchbacks selectively eat the stem. Huh. And it's so you're talking about the milky sap in it. Yeah, you're talking the flower stem. Yeah, the the yeah, because they don't have a stem to the plant itself. <laughs> right. It's it's uh, more appropriately, it would probably be called the um, the peduncle um, or the pedicel. Like probably the pedicel because it's well, I don't know. I'd have to think about that. Um, Get your body John, book out. John McZoo is here of the Reptile Show Reporter. John, good to see you. Welcome. We're talking backyard turtle and tortoise harvest. Um, do you have any aquatic turtles that you feed plants that you harvest in the backyard? I, I don't. I don't have really any aquatic yeah. turtles to, to speak of. Um, I recently got uh, some turtles gifted to me, but they're the aquatic box turtle. Okay. And yeah, yeah, yeah. They're very, very young. So they're still yeah. just, you know, living in. Hard to say. A quarter inch of water. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. I mean, I've, I have a painted turtle, but you know, you, you hear about sliders being vegetarian. And so, you know, is that, what is the, like, can you harvest the weeds? Would they eat those? Or are they just eating aquatic plants? I don't know. I've never tried it. And I've never given my painted turtle anything too. He's still pretty small. Um, but, uh, Podrick says that he's got, uh, he's got tons of wild lettuce. His tortoises love it. Um, is that like Lactuca, Padraig? Let us know. And he says he recently found out that lyre leaf sage is edible. That's definitely another in the mint family. I'm going to try it out on the tortoises as it is everywhere here. So that's good stuff. Um, do you dry any of the things that you harvest? You know, I haven't tried that yet. I've, I've seen where people are doing that and you know, they're, they're buying these little three or multiple tiered hanging yep. um, things that they put leaves in and, and dry them out in the sun. Yep. And, uh, Apparently they're for marijuana. That's what they're made for. <laughs> I hadn't seen that yet. <laughs> I, I, I talked, I talked to Will Espenshade about this cause I'm, you know, Will gave a presentation. I wasn't there, but at TTPG where he talked about how you can really harvest your backyard and create turtle food. And so he showed these multi-layer drying things. And then I'm talking about doing some things for him. And he shows me these racks. And I'm like, these are too polished and fancy. Um, they have to be for drying pot. And he's like, yeah, that's their primary <laughs> use. <laughs> oh, that's fun. Um, so Patrick is not sure. Um, yeah. Last time we talked a lot about your box. Turtle. 
Um, Asian box turtles, you know, different. Oh, okay. Um, oh, poppies. Um, he's talking about poppies. Now, that's something I haven't uh, tried uh, for my tortoises. Um, it might make them a little wonky. Uh, but the, uh, yeah, the opium poppy, that's serious uh, stuff. You used to, it was the 1990s, you would get uh, investigated by the feds and the ATF for growing drugs, but not anymore. It's a different world. Um, so yeah, what's uh, what what are what what's uh, a big project that you're working on now, Phil? Uh, well, this year my big project is is to get uh, some turtles outside mm -hmm. uh, into my backyard. Uh, I want to try to get as many turtles that can, you know, live in my climate year round. Mm -hmm. I want to get them outside where they can experience that instead of, you know, me trying to um, come up with methods to artificially, you know, create different seasons. Mm -hmm. uh, so the idea is I want to, I want to get some outside enclosures. I've been watching some of your YouTube videos about you. uh, your, your outdoor enclosure for your three toed box turtles. Yep. It's a lot of work. That's all I'll say. <laughs> What are you thinking about doing? What style? What uh, materials? Well, I, it's a big question. I, I've yeah. been, I've looked at a lot of different stuff. Like people are using this like uh, corrugated sheet metal. I've seen some of those. Yep. And uh, landscape yep. timbers and yep. uh, two by twelves. I mean, there's a lot of different options. Yep. Yeah. Um, aesthetics uh, is always a consideration, but Sometimes it's not, depending upon where you live and the spousal acceptance factor, neighbor <laughs> acceptance factor, and all that stuff. Um, so that's something to consider. But our, you know, and I'm I'm the guy, kind of person that likes to tinker and try lots of different things. So uh, that's that's me. I, I try them all and see kind of what I like eventually. Um, are you leaning in any 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 ways or? Well, I was just listening to the uh, Let's Talk Turtles yeah. podcast uh, yeah. last week, and where yeah. Ryan was talking about you know trying to get the lid, the screen lids off of yeah. his outdoor enclosures. Uh, I kind of I had a chuckle because you know you were asking him, well, you know who's complaining about them? Your neighbors or your yeah. spouse? And he's like, yeah, I'm I don't like, care what my spouse yeah. or I don't care what yeah. my neighbors yeah. think. Yeah, we didn't we didn't want to. Um... Oh, I forget why uh, Ryan's wife. Maybe Ray, Rebecca. Rachel? Rebecca? I, I think it's Rebecca, but yeah, I think um, right. <laughs> yeah, that was hilarious. He's like, <laughs> I've been told that my lids are ugly. <laughs> like, really? Who told you that? So, like, um, he, like he mentioned, yeah. uh, he was looking into the electric wires yes. to to put around enclosures. Yeah, you ever uh, done so that? I have never done that. Um, yeah, I, I think. In our last last time I was on here, I was talking about growing up on a ranch in oh, Oklahoma, right. and we had we used you know electric fencing in some places, and I can remember as a kid touching those fences. <laughs> it it doesn't kill you, but you'll remember it. <laughs> it's like it just it, it like it goes to every part of your body for like a sh quick second, you know, like it. It's a imperceptible amount of time almost, but it's such a weird feeling. At least that's how I've experienced it. Oh, um, I mean, I to me that it kind of scares the crap out of me. <laughs> like I can just imagine my kids getting zapped or a neighbor or some accident right. happening. Uh, like I just I can't go there. So. Yeah, um, yeah, it's it's kind of crazy that the things that you can worry about what could happen with that. Yeah, uh, but I've I've got to have something, you know, whether it's wire or yeah. screen tops, because I see raccoons in my backyard all the time. Yeah, you know, every, I'm, every, raccoons are everywhere. Yeah, I'm not leaving that to chance. Like if there are people, there are raccoons. True. That that I mean, so um, it's yeah, they suck. <laughs> They're such fascinating creatures, but man, if you keep turtles, oh my gosh, raccoons are just so bad and horrible. And, I mean, 
if you're in the chat, let me know if you don't have raccoons. I'm just curious. Maybe Mike in Canada, uh, <laughs> maybe you, you don't have the same problem we do with raccoons. But um, man, I mean, we just trash panda is the favorite word of one of our police officers at work. Um, it's not so. Um, how how big and and how many uh, enclosures are you thinking about building? Um, well, I'm, I'm of course keeping them, um, species specific. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, to, to, to get me going, I, I'm going to start with the, the plan is to build one, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but totally. then I also started Good looking plan. at materials and like, okay, well, what if I use, you know, longer dimension lumber for like outside walls and then divide the large enclosure into smaller ones so that you could have, you know, uh, the like different box turtle species, for example, in different enclosures next to each other. Yeah. But, um, um, one of the, one of the things that, um, especially, I mean, if they're going to be in there all the time, but if you, know, you can make these giant pens, but they're hard to make lids for, Right. Um, and so anything wider than about four feet is really hard to like just reach in. So, you know, if you have an eight by eight pen or something like that, you know, to put a like a lid on that, that is that is hard. So that is that's kind of why I went with the long and narrow uh, option for the box turtles. I hate the lids I have. And I will tell you, like, I should want an electric fence because I so love to just watch the turtles crawl and have plants that grow up and logs yep. and wood and have some topography in there. Yep. And once you put a lid on there, that really just ruins kind of the experience of you watching the turtles just kind of hang out or the tortoises. And um, I mean, that, that defeats the purpose and then you're like messing with lids all the time. So right. get the electric stuff. Um, but uh, do you have any like uh, homeowners association restrictions or anything like that? Do you have to I deal don't. With that kind of stuff. That's I don't. Where I where I live, there's no homeowners association, so I can kind of get away with pretty much anything. Yeah. Uh, no, me too. I mean, we don't. I have. I live in a neighborhood where the people wish there was a horse. <laughs> and, and quite frankly, someone told me that the first week I lived here. Uh, believe it or not. Like, um, this, was, this neighborhood was supposed to have a homeowners association. and You have a fence. And nobody was supposed to have fences in this neighborhood. And you have a shed. And nobody was supposed to have sheds in this neighborhood. So I just want you to know that. Huh. Thanks for welcoming me to the neighborhood. And I've, ne I've never talked to that guy again. And I've just been like, well, thanks, bud. We know where you stand. Uh, Mikey Ben's here. Hey, Mikey Ben. How are the carpet chameleons doing? Um, those are pretty awesome. Patrick says that he trapped five raccoons last summer. So, Pat, uh, Patrick, are you actively trapping, like, all the time? Do you have trap set is that part of your strategy and then the second follow-up question is what um, how do you how do you dispose of the raccoons do you euthanize them do you let them go somewhere um that's a tough one mikey ben says uh, he lives up uh in ontario coon skunks and rabbits wabbits i don't know that uh, i've ever heard any problems with rabbits with turtles but you know, maybe a baby they could take away or something. I don't know. Podrick says cats and possums are a problem. And rac uh, Mike Mike has raccoons in Vancouver Island, too. So, um, <coughs> um, so yeah, those are some of the things. Um, you know, the, the trade-off with mine, I, I have, I'd use landscaping timbers. And that was just a lot of work. They're heavy. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it's built like a tank, though. <laughs> and, you know, and then I have my open top, hitchback day pens. 
Mm. And I used the two by twelves with the concrete uh, raised garden bed um, style blocks. Do, do you like those blocks? They're they're great, but you know it, it would be I wouldn't feel <coughs> comfortable like putting a lid on that because it's it's it would be hard to attach them in the corners. Um, but for like day pens, the blocks are good. I, I like it. You know, you can basically just cut your two by twelves to length and uh, level up the ground a little bit, um, and then go from there. It's pretty, pretty simple. I've seen some really nice outdoor enclosures. The um, the president of Matt's, yeah, has in his backyard, and he, he built walk in enclosures. I mean, so so, so you have. Full height. Yes, full height. Yeah. Completely covered with hardware cloth. Yeah. Tops. You're, de you're definitely getting the attention of your neighbors. If you, go <laughs> you are. <laughs> he did a really nice job. He's got like uh, little pavers that wind through and yeah. make certain make a you come back oh, the way you funny. came from. Yeah, and, no, that's awesome. Put do labels. You guys, do you take tours of like each other's collections? Uh, for, occasionally. For yeah, yeah. Uh, occasionally we go to his house for our Matt's uh, summer picnic, and it's, so it's always fun to go there. How many active members are in Matt's? Like when um, you know, we had our we had a meeting about a month ago, and I think at that time we were somewhere around three hundred total members. Yeah, and then how many eight. come to the meetings? Um, well, now that we've opened it up with. Uh, some remote attendees so we have people oh, who come in yeah. person yeah and then we're also doing remote meetings so it's that's expanded the number so we've gone from uh maybe 15 or 20 people coming to an in-person meeting to now adding another 15 or you know 20 on top of that who come in through remote meetings patrick, oh, patrick Lee Lee. Says he attends via zoom that's awesome yeah. i need that to get awesome. hooked up and attend because um Northern Ohio used to have the Northern Ohio Herp Association, but it is um, it has just really been on the decline, unfortunately. Well, the, it barely exists anymore. They don't have meetings. And, um, one of their things they did was education, um, and they would bring out animals to different events and stuff like that. And we have a reptile rescue that does that a lot, and I think a lot of people, well, Quite frankly, do stuff like this on YouTube. So, I still would love to have a turtle and tortoise society here in Ohio. Um, maybe one day I'll turn my Facebook group into a real society. Okay, what is Padraig talking about? He says he started digging a two foot deep area for Russian tortoises pen this fall. Okay, so Russians dig. Um, he says he's sinking the walls that deep to keep them from. Digging out. Yeah. Those things are crazy diggers. They spend most of their lives underground. You ever keep Russians? Do you have any Russians? I do. Yeah, I have some Russians uh, that I've adopted from the local animal shelter. Uh -huh. And some that I've taken as surrenders. Um, some from Matt's. Uh, some from uh, Tortoise Forum. People who wanted to get up, give up their Russians and they live down the road from me. You know, so... Yeah. So I have I have a few Russians here and um, like Podrick, I think Dragon Layer, that's Podrick, right? Yep, that's Podrick. Like his saying, you have to dig these the walls down. And it's not just for Russians. I mean, it's for box turtles too. They love, you know, to dig. And mm -hmm. so that's part of the plan and uh, trying to get the outdoor enclosures together is you know, you get the shovel out and you know start digging trenches to so <laughs> you can lay your walls down in there and <laughs> keep keep any from digging out and escaping. Look. So Home Depot has these little mini excavators that you can rent. Oh, really? The next time I do anything, like I'm, I'm renting one of those puppies. Um, <laughs> I mean, they're tiny. You pro you probably have to have a trailer, but maybe they're on their own trailer. Oh man, it's so tempting. I don't have Ooh. a car with a hitch, but um, I do. <laughs> You're giving I mean, me ideas, Tom. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean seriously, like if you need to dig. Uh, like a pond or something. Like I, 
I'm t- I'm halfway to ninety now. So um, if <laughs> if I uh, if, if if I like I used to jump in, you know, digging all the holes for ponds and stuff like that, but no more. The last time I did it, I was like sore for a month. <laughs> Well, my my neighbor um, had an uh, unpleasant experience over the last couple of years. He wanted to do some work in his front yard, and he he was digging a big hole in his front yard, and he kept hitting rocks and bricks, and it was just getting really difficult. He's like, "What's going on here?" So he eventually hired somebody that came out with one of those mini excavators, and they started digging around. And apparently, the builder, when they had done this neighborhood, they used his front yard as like a fill, a, a dump for. Mm-hmm broken bricks and cinder blocks nice. and rocks that had been dug up for foundations, you know, of houses. And they just dumped them all in his front yard, put a little topsoil over top of it and planted grass. And there you go. So that's that my would, nightmare. That would I'm be like, horrible. I'm like, I hope I don't find that in my backyard. Here we have giant boulders from the glaciers that were just kind of dumped. So, so like, and even at my last house, um, I started digging one of the corner posts and like, oh, I hit a rock. And that, you know, that rock, I'm like, oh, that's, that's kind of, kind of a big rock. And I, st- I kept digging and digging and that rock went from like this big, to this big. I mean, it, it was probably three feet across this rock. And like, there's no way I could have moved that. A mini excavator couldn't do it. But so what's your target? Like, um, how, how deep are you going to dig down? And are you going to have like a wall in the ground? that deep are you going to use like some kind of fencing i've seen people put fencing kind of underneath or or really kind of on top of the soil of the enclosure so that the the turtle can't dig right next to the wall but theoretically they could dig down in the center and then underneath it so yeah what's your digging out strategy to prevent that (laughs) Well, I was thinking I was thinking what I was going to try to do, and I need to test this out and see how it's going to work with my soil. And like you said, with uh, the, how many rocks or how many rocks am I going to run across? Once yeah. I, you know, 12 inches down. But my, my plan was to dig uh, so that the walls were somewhere at least 18 inches, preferably 24 inches deep, deep. into the ground. That's deep. That's a lot That's of work. Deep. Yeah, you need an excavator. <laughs> total mini excavator for that um and then remind us which species of box turtles you have again as far as things that can live outside in virginia year round oh well it's it's amazing the different species that can can do that i mean of course there's the eastern box turtle which you know do they spend outside in winter all the way up as yeah. far as uh, pennsylvania i think even southern, southern- new york Southern Maine used to have like one population of box turtles are gone now. But, yeah. So they can survive it and uh, three-toed box turtles, ornate box turtles. And there are people who even keep uh, Gulf Coast and Florida box turtles. I mean, I know people as far mm-hmm. as New Jersey who are keeping yeah. both of those species outdoor year round. I've, I've got my three toads. I used to have Easterns when I was a kid. Um, they're pretty pretty amazing um animals i'm trying i'm checking with padrick he says try digging at age 74 so padrick you should definitely <laughs> be renting a excavator rent an excavator padrick you can do it um and then padrick uses the meshed uh wire on the bottom of the raised bed they can't dig deeper than two feet um any worries about that rusting? Do you do you use plastic, Padrick, or metal? I'd be kind of worried about it rusting or just disintegrating, even if it were galvanized. But uh, I don't know. I don't have any Russians. You know what? I it, it Russians spook me because of things like mycoplasma and some of the other things that they can carry. Have you ever had any concerns about? quarantine with Russian tortoises or them spreading disease to your other turtles or tortoises? Well, I, I keep 
I, I have a firm law of keeping my turtles and my tortoises separate. Um, tortoises always, well, everything, any, any animal that comes in goes through a quarantine period where I can kind of, you know, watch and see what's happening and any signs of, you know, an upper respiratory infection or any edema or anything like that. And so everybody goes through a quarantine that for at least three months, sometimes, you know, just because I'm lazy and I don't get around to, uh, introducing them to the big group, it might be six months or a year. Yeah. 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 Me too. Um, and, and, but by species, you're keeping individuals together by species. And, Absolutely. and subspecies. Yeah. Yeah. What I, about, you know, well, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I, I don't even mix my box turtles, yeah. you know, by species. Um, I try to. Eastern, Easterns are their own thing. Three it three. would probably be fine. I mean, you know, there's integrated zones between all the different yeah. you know, species of box turtle, yeah. but, you know, I. Plus, they could hybridize. I mean, they that's could. not good. Yeah. And I'm, I'm um, not interested in that. Unless you want to be interested in it. Um, but, yeah, creating hybrids of animals that live in North America where they're being kept, definitely a bad idea. Um, Patrick says it's actually heavy-duty plastic cage wire. So, yeah, that would be good. Um, I, you know, I've seen where they have uh, hardware cloth which is, you know, they, they call it cloth, but it's a, yeah. it's a metal mesh. The grid, and you yeah. can buy it coated with plastic. Is is that what Dragon Layer is talking uh, about? I, you know, he, he's probably, well, maybe. Um, you know, the the stuff that Mark Cantos uses, the vinyl coated wire, that kind of stuff, um, that would be mm -hmm. a really good option. I, you know, it sounds like Podrick is just talking about plastic fencing that you can buy. Keep out rabbits from your garden or something like that. But uh, no, I mean that th that sounds good. I mean, I I will tell you I didn't do that uh, on my box turtle enclosure. It's open on the bottom. Uh, I didn't think I would be hibernating them outside, um, but they could still always dig out. It's a possibility. Um, there's I have a lot of rock around it, and I'm checking them all the time, but. You know, it could happen. Um, yeah. Well, that sounds cool. Start with one enclosure, one subspecies of a box turtle, and see how it goes. Yep. It's a good plan. Yeah. You have plenty of space uh, on on your property, or do you have to kind of carefully plan where things go? Uh, I don't have a lot of space. Yeah. Um, I'm here. Uh, legally, I have a third of an acre. Okay, acres. yeah. So that's about I have like 0.4. So and just enough to have a few things, but out, outside of the the legal description, um <laughs> my house does back up to oh, nice. <clears throat> back up to some property that's like separates the residential area from a light commercial area. Oh, it's it's owned by the county. And so they just let it go. I mean, it's just wild yeah, yeah. woods. Natural. And, you know, the whole neighborhood, we've all kind of encroached into that yeah. a little bit. You know, it's like, oh, I could get another, you know, 10 yeah. feet. <laughs> Let me tell you, Phil, I used to work for the state of Ohio and everybody encroached on <laughs> the state parkland. It was, it was quite interesting. I mean, the, the thing, we didn't, when people built things like structures on our property, that's when we started to notice. Oh, that's funny. Um, cool. Okay. So what other projects you got going on or what are you working on? What's, uh, what's hot in your world? Mm, that's hot. I, I guess my the biggest thing that I'm working on, uh, this year is the, um, Cora Mashati Abstai. Okay. I, yeah. Yeah. I had a, a small group of those that I, I've been collecting over the years, you know, a couple of hatchings one year, a couple of hatchlings the next year. Well, they're all like, you know, seven and eight years old now. And I just recently got a couple of uh, uh, additions to that group. Okay. And so some of my turtles uh, are half siblings. Okay. So this new, these new couple are completely unrelated. Nice. And so I'm pretty excited to, you know, kind of plan out how I'll introduce 
and and cross the the new turtles into the half siblings. Interesting. I I love. If I had a Korra, it would be the old Pixidia or uh, what's now Korra. Um, Opsti, Opsti, that's a subspecies. How do you tell those apart from the nominate form? The nominate species uh, tends to have uh, a solid yellow um, plastron. Or not always yellow, tan, yellow color, no spots, whereas, no blotching. Right. Whereas the obsti have blotches. Okay. Um, it's usually four or five, six blotches sometimes. I've seen them with only two or three, or, you know, or not two or three. They usually occur in pairs. So I've seen them in two or four. Um, but typically, if they have blotches, they are obsti. Interesting. So you, it's rare that you get to see a plastron in a ad on fauna or something like that. So that totally makes sense. I mean, are, are is their carapace darker than the other one sometimes, or does it have like a, a almost like a two tone appearance, or am I just making that up? Uh, yeah, it's very variable as, okay. as far as I've seen. Um, I have seen a lot of those, like you're talking about the two tone. Yeah, they with that dark color uh, mixed yeah. with like a kind of a mahogany red yep. kind of color. Yep. But I've also seen that in the nominate species. Okay. And uh, I think it kind of like any any species or subspecies of of, of turtle, um, especially if they occur over a large um, range, you can you find different coloration and, and and markings depending on what part of the range they come from. Um, now, I kept a pair of these turtles. They weren't mine. I cared for them while I was a student at college. And my professor had bought them from Glades Herp, and they came in, and, and the female had just horrible shell rot over her uh, kind of nuchal, well, in her nuchal area, that scoot around the neck. Um, what, what's their behavior like? How do they interact with each other? Because I got the sense that the male could be really aggressive with the female. And, and he or she might have gotten this injury just by being, like, attacked by other males, perhaps. Maybe in the holding pens or something like that. Um, yeah, what's their behavior like? Yeah, the, the females do okay together. You know they're they're pretty happy to get along, but the males have to be kept separate from the females. I mean, only put them together. You know, if you're actively trying to to breed, um, because like like you were saying, the the males are are brutal. They they go after the uh, the marginal shells of a female, yeah, and will just chew them off literally. Well, I mean that's 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 what happened, and it 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 was like. Oh my God! What happened to this turtle? I had no idea at the time, but later I kind of saw little snippets of this behavior. I mean, that it's like, how does that make evolutionary sense? <laughs> like, bite your mate's shell off. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think they're just really—they're like geared to really try to breed. I mean, and, uh -huh. and of course, in nature, you know, there, there's so much more room. A female has a chance to escape. You know, she can walk off and keep walking whereas the you know the male might get distracted and but when we have them in captivity they they just that they have to be kept separately because there's nowhere for the female to go there's only so much room for her to you know try to escape and slip off in the the dark of night <laughs> i'm really curious about how you have them set up as far as enclosures go um are they at all aquatic how do you have them set up? Um, I set up uh, uh, hatchlings definitely in in water, just just like I would do uh, a, okay. a box turtle. Um, and as uh, when they get to be about two, three years old, I give them the option that they give them like a half and half um, enclosure that's half water, half uh, moist, boggy substrate with you know, sphagnum moss that they can dig down into. And then as they get older. I move them into an almost uh, 
almost completely terrestrial enclosure with a large water dish to soak in, uh, maybe a chick feeder so that they have clean water to drink in because we all know, you know, box turtles from all continents, they yeah. love nothing more than to dirty up their their water. <laughs> all, all, all land turtles, they all they want to do is poop in their water. Like yeah. that's one thing in life they want to do, it's poop in their water. Oh, look, there's clean water. Let me soil it. <laughs> um, there's a, a message or a learning lesson behind that. We just haven't totally figured it out. But um, And have you ever had them in, like, deep water? Um, can they swim? Do they just sort of float and bob around like a, a North American box turtle? You know, you know, I've never tried that, Tom. I've, I've never had them in water deep enough that yeah. they couldn't you know, kind of use their, their feet to kind of crawl yeah. along the bottom and that, never, that never sense. tried to drop him into the deep end of the pool. And then how about uh, feeding them? What kind of things did they eat? Oh, anything North American box will eat. Okay. They will eat. Uh, so they get fruit. worms. Yeah. I get a little more fruit than a, than a North American box turtle. Um, you know, I try to do a little research on what kind of trees and bushes, um, you know, over there in Asia, like, uh, there's the, um, what do they call it? The Asian raspberry. I think here in the United States, we call them wine berries. Oh yeah. And, yeah. That's uh, an invasive plant. In <laughs> yeah, it is. It's very invasive. Ask Actually, me. I have them. They grow in my backyard. I'm <laughs> mine too. All the time. <laughs> I'm always digging them up and it's like, you know, a year or two later they're back and I'm like, I dug those things up by the root. How are they back again? <laughs> Birds. Birds are yeah. bringing new ones. That's all I can think of. So I, that's I so interesting. Those. Huh? Yeah. Do you do you you just do you have a patch of them and you let some grow? Or I, I do. Yeah, I have a that's certain cool. little patch of them that I go ahead and let those grow and um, try to weed out everything. And they were here when I moved into this house um, eighteen years ago, and it's just been a kind of a constant battle to keep them in check, that, to, so that they're just a small group and not covering the whole neighborhood you know oh man i i probably should let some grow up and podrick says evolutionarily that pooping in the water may be a way to not be tracked by predators i'll buy it yeah yeah i like it for sure um uvb and supplementation for the uh, Pixidia um, and light heat? Uh, I use mercury vapor bulbs and they seem to like those pretty well. Um, I am, I'm kind of I'm on, on the fence. I've been kind of thinking about switching from mercury vapor bulb to um, fluorescent from a UVB bulbs. And using CHEs, uh, ceramic heat emitters for heat, because mm -hmm. there's been some debate about whether or not the wavelength that comes off of a mercury vapor bulb is uh, maybe not so so great for the shells of our turtles and and their shell growth. And there's been a lot of uh, constructive argument about that over on Tortoise Forum, and uh, they they can be kind of hot. I mean, of course, you can raise your bulb up and down, and you yeah. know, to get the temperature you want. But they they do have kind of a heart a hot heat that comes off of them. So, but I've been I've been using mercury vapor bulbs up to this point with with good results. I yeah, will say that. Are you using MVB bulbs that that was redundant? Um, mercury vapor bulbs from. Zoomed or Exoterra or the name brands, or are you using a different type? Yeah, the the Zoomed uh, Power Sun. Yeah, yeah. The, that's the only one I've ever used. Yeah, you know, I've read reviews about the other, and I guess there's the Arcadia yep. makes some really good ones. Yep. They're making them now. Yep. Now yeah, let me ask you this: those. I've I've bought one in my lifetime. How long have your mate uh, your bulbs lasted? Um, I'm curious about. Well, there, there's some range of, of effectiveness. Um, yeah. Anything from six months to I've had some that lasted for two years yeah. and we're still going strong. Uh, there's there's a, a, 
kind of a scam that goes on with those. You have to be careful about where you buy your bulbs from um, because people are, I don't know, they will buy these bulbs, they'll use them, and then they'll repackage them and return them. So I, I've heard about that. Yeah. yeah, so anytime I get a new bulb out of the box, and, and really should do it with any any bulb you know i test it with the uvb meter and yeah. you know make sure that this bulb out of the box is actually producing uvb and uh you have the uh 6.5 solar meter is that what you use? i actually have both of them i think it's the yeah. 6.2 and the 6.5 i just happen to have my six. Oh, nice there. <laughs> get one of these people get one of these You'll it's well well them. worth the money um I mean, yeah no, totally. And that's that's how you're checking your bulbs. Now, do you keep your mercury vapor bulbs around and just use them as uh, light or heat bulbs? You ever do that? Or when they're stopped? Oh, when they're old? You, you, yeah, yeah. Yes. They're, they're no... Yes. Yeah, and because my experience... I, like, literally, I have a mercury vapor power sun zoom ed bulb that I bought in... 2018 that bulb is still putting out light and heat six years later like, yeah yeah that's like we shy away at 80 bucks but that thing is still going i mean that is incredible yeah they're, have, they're you quality the same thing? their quality control is pretty good because um, i've noticed that too that even after the, the bulb stops produ producing uh, a good level of uvb uh, that you can still use them like you say for heat and for visual light uh, for years yeah. after that. Yeah, um, like years. I, I, don't know, I don't know how many UVBs I've gone through over the years. I mean, 100, 200, I don't know. You know but I've only had one bulb do something kind of scary on me. Um, one okay. day I, I went to turn on a UVB, a uh, 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 mercury vapor bulb, excuse me, yep. and it popped and cracked and started smoking and i don't know what happened there i mean it was done it stopped work i turned it off i pulled the plug i was like oh my god yeah and then i'm on the internet like because you know, these things have mercury in them right so then i'm on the internet going okay how much mercury just released into my my room <laughs> you know i've got windows open and but it turned out um uh, somebody who sounded very knowledgeable about uh, electronics and mercury came in and said that you know, yeah they have mercury in them but the amount that would be released is not going to hurt anybody you know it, it's such a small amount of mercury that it's not a big deal and fluorescent tubes have mercury if yeah, they, they do mercury, mercury um, yes lots of other nasty gases um I know Ryan and I on the Let's Talk Turtles podcast, we talked about the demise of cheap household halogen bulbs. And, um, I, you know, I think for turtle people, that is going to hit hard. Maybe not quite as much for tortoises. But, I mean, going back to kind of what you said about that debate on the tortoise forum about this, you know, what does happen when these artificial light sources hit a tortoise's shell and, you know, I, it just can't be a good things, right? So we don't know exactly what's happening, but we do know, like, if you keep them at really high humidity and don't bake them, we can grow smooth shells. But mm -hmm. if, you, if you have your young tortoise under one of these really hot lamps, I mean, you're going to get bad results. Now, you put a lizard under that same light, they love it, right? But, you know, like, hot heat 24 hours a day seems to be, like, a thing for reptiles. And that's, it's like a the standard, what people think. And uh, I don't, I mean, tortoises just, I mean, I don't have the tortoises that live out in the sun and bask all day long, but... To me, I don't use heat bulbs with a lot of my hinge backs at all. Um, and I've gotten pretty good results. So 
I, I just, yeah, what, what are your thoughts? And, and what are some of the, what's the argument on TFO, Tortoise Forum? What are people talking about? What, what are they? A lot, of stuff, a lot of stuff they're talking about, I'll have to admit, I, I feel like it's a little bit over my head. I mean, like, yeah. I think these people have really gone in depth, you know, down the rabbit hole kind of study yeah. on wavelength and the, the heat that comes with it. But I guess in a nutshell, what they're saying is that, um, for nice smooth growth uh you don't want the new layer of growth on a on a shell's scoot you don't want it to be overheated and dry mm -hmm. otherwise that leads to you know pyramiding and, and other deformities mm -hmm. um and i, I can't say you know, i've raised um turtles under both and i've gotten i mean both uh, mercury vapor bulb and fluorescent Mm -hmm. uh, the, which is not quite as hot mm -hmm. and i've gotten good results both ways smooth yeah. shells but now th that's a caveat that i'm keeping them at a, a, a you know tremendously high humidity level mm -hmm. 95 percent or more yeah. so any any drying effect that uh, the light rays could have on the new growth on a scoot is i think kind of offset by the fact that the humidity in the, in the container is so high and i i think I will tell you, I think that is the, one of the most interesting things when I got back into the turtle and tortoise world was in 2018. And this whole idea of raising your tortoises at very high relative humidities was kind of novel and new. And a lot of people were saying, no, that's not the way to do it. But they also couldn't grow a smooth tortoise. And I, I mean, I... Andy Highfield of the Tortoise Trust, who lives in Spain and does a lot of observations of tortoises, he just posted this long diatribe about how tortoises don't have high humidity in the wild. You know, it's quite low. And I'm like, you know, how is he measuring that? Is he is he actually taking, a, you know, a sling psychrometer or... Uh, hygrometer and measuring where the tortoise actually is because my guess is that tortoise is hiding in a little bush and it yes. is really high humidity it is it, even just like a you know six feet away it might be 25 percent humidity mm -hmm. um but he's he's kind of saying this 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 is bunk but i mean i think anybody that has kept tortoises and raised pyramided tortoises and then has switched to this high humidity method and sees smooth shells there's something to that yeah absolutely i, I think turtles are a little bit different than like we you, you talk about reptiles in general loving the sun like you you mentioned the the lizards under under these you know heat lamps and they just love it they can't get enough of it i think turtles can be a little bit different in some instances and i think it, it has to do with their evolution you know what the animal that they originally came from it was it lived a lot of a lot of its time and in some cases exclusively underground it was a digger and a tunneler yeah, and true. yeah so yeah so you got that high humidity down there yeah. you're not exposed to the dry air outside that yeah. you know, the air it's been dried out by the sun and so they're kind of humid murky underground you know animals so it's kind of amazing how they've how they've evolved that some turtles are still like that that you know they still want to dig and tunnel and burrow a lot and uh, then there are the some Russian that just tortoise. yeah yeah it's a good example it lives like 95 percent of its life underground yeah yeah whether it's so how, did, it's how can hot. andy highfield say they're not experiencing these high levels of humidity i mean it just makes no sense to me. yeah well, and there may be exceptions. I mean, there are there are tortoise species that you know live out in a dry, scrubby areas, and they're not big diggers because their their size, you know, kind of makes it more difficult for them to do that. Um, but uh, I, I think for the majority, you know, these these like we always you always hear people talk about. I, I'd rather keep my turtles a little bit too cool and too humid than to keep them too hot and too dry. And I think I think if you raise animals under different conditions, you see the the that that is true. That it's better not to keep them you know too hot and definitely not too dry. Let me 
me ask you this. How has how how long have you been a Mats member? Um I've been I think I joined Mats uh it's probably been eight or nine years ago. Have have you seen a paradigm shift in Mats? Um has has that organization adopted the high humidity method? Um, do you talk about that at all? Do, do you remember when um, people shared that information? Or is this just a thing that's like spreading on the internet? Yeah, well, it's definitely spreading on the internet. And it is yeah. it is spreading through the local societies too. Um, yeah. You know, we, we all have talked about the, the humidity conditions. And there's some people who have large uh, tortoises, it's hard for them to keep them in, you know, in a container that's humid. So they're building, you know, plastic tents over top of their tortoises living area so that they can, and it might be in the garage, but they've got this plastic tent over top of it. That's holding this humidity inside this chamber for, for the tortoise. So it's definitely something, uh, that we talk about and share, mm -hmm. um, with each other and show the results. I mean, you say, yeah, this person had this tortoise and they raised it dry and look at its shell. And this person had the you know, same species. They had a tent for over it to hold in humidity and the shell is smoother. And uh, the, the one that was raised dry has a uh, large, very well-defined growth of, of the, of the scoots and it's kind of dry and has some cracks in it. And you might even have a scoot that's kind of popped up. And it's not laying down smooth like it should. And I think that's all, you know, evidence that keeping them a little, keeping them more humid is the better way to go. I wish someone would be able to do a, a research study on this using this new technique. Um, as far as I can tell, it, it hasn't been done. I mean, I'm tempted to buy a hundred like leopard tortoises or something like that and, <laughs> and set up different humidity regimes and chambers to document this scientifically and to, you know, make sure the study is done in a statistically significant way. Um, as far as I can tell, reading the literature, there's one paper that was published using sulcata tortoises, looking at pyramiding, and what they tested was nighttime temperature uh, and diet and, and the differences in the tortoises. And so the, um, the tortoises that had reduced temperature at nighttime were less pyramided than those that did not have a temperature reduction at nighttime. So okay. what do we know about temperature and relative humidity? Um, as temperature goes down, relative humidity goes up. That's just the laws of physics. Right. Um, the, the, you know, and so Another Are they thing really I, uh, seeing the effects of a higher relative humidity instead of the effects of a lower temperature is my question. Maybe. I, I think that's possible. But, um, the paper's out there. It's about a decade old. You can find it on Google Scholar. But, another but, thing I like yeah. to do, we, you know, we're talking about humidity and all this. Another yeah. thing that I like to do is to try to um, follow sort of the natural cycle of a, a turtle's home range. Yeah. Um, so like that we've got the spider tortoise, you know, from Madagascar that experiences this, you know, dry period where it basically estivates for, you know, four or five months and digs itself in and just doesn't really do anything. And then once um, the monsoon comes through and they get rain and humidity and plants start to grow, they come back out you know, into the open and do some, you know, some browsing. And you've got the same thing in China and Southeast Asia, uh, India, when the monsoon, you know, there's these periods of time when the monsoons uh, come through and these animals are kind of inundated with rain. I mean, it even happens here. We, I always used to think about the monsoon as, as being an Asian thing. 
but we had monsoon here in the United States or yeah. North America, I should say, uh, the southeastern United or southwestern United States and uh, the northwestern part of Mexico, uh, the Sierra Madre Occidental. There's a monsoon season during the North American summer where, you know, outside of that period, it's very dry and uh, turtles are very inactive. And then this monsoon comes through and all of a sudden they come out and they're eating bugs and they're you know, eating mushrooms and it's breeding time, you know, because there, there's plenty and, and living off the fat of the land, you know. So I try to imitate that a little bit with my captive turtles, you know, my turtles that exhibit if they would exhibit a monsoon season in their native environment i try to imitate that by increasing the the humidity of their enclosures um take you know whether it's a pitcher of water and just pouring it in there or getting one of the pump sprayers that you yep. can, like you know pump up and just spray them a couple times a day make them feel like oh it's raining and you see them i see them right. being more active and totally their appetites are stimulated. You know, that rain comes in and they're out looking for food. Yeah. I mean, people go home, they, they buy a Herman's tortoise at PetSmart and keep it in a box and might never, it might net, it might not ever experience what rain is like, but those are really important uh, hormonal and environmental cues, right? To trigger things like breeding or hibernation and, um, I mean, that's what I love about turtle keeping is like learning about where the turtles are from and what their environment's like and what are the humidity and temperature regimes. You know, how cold does it get at night? How hot does it get in the day? How can a home's hinchback live on the equator with their average temperature when found in the wild is 72 degrees? You know, wow. they're, they're looking for the cold spots. Everyone's like, they're from Africa and they're from the equator. So I need to keep this thing at like 95 degrees. Well, you can't put enough humidity in the air at 95 degrees. It'll always be too dry for them. And yeah, in the wild, they like 72. So I think that's a huge thing about turtle and tortoise keeping that I love. Look who's here. So does Exotics, a.k.a. Sam. Sam, where you been, man? Where you been? Gotta, gotta, uh, yeah. you were always our first commenter, man. Right. Um, first. Yeah, we. We gotta, we gotta have you back. Um, very cool. I mean, I, 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 I think that's awesome. Like, how do you study these climate patterns? What tools do you learn, or do you use to learn about this stuff for exotic animals halfway around the world? Uh, well, there. I mean, you could just Google, you know, yeah. a, a, a country and a city. Uh, you know, I usually try to find out um what is the what the range of my uh, the species that i keep is and then search that range a couple of different you know north south east west and see what the variability is and for each one the, depending on what part of the world it is there might be a different weather channel uh you know that's keeping track and showing you what the daily weather is and the daily humidity and what the annual fluctuation of rainfall and temperatures are and uh, I just use whatever I find, you know, that comes up locally. You know, I, I found it's pretty easy to get the kind of weather information, right? But to find good climate graphs that are pretty decent, I think that can be a little intimidating for people. Um, but if you can uh, find a climate graph, it's it's really helpful because usually you'll be able to see that up and down mm -hmm. temperature levels and on the same graph they'll have like a line for precipitation and a line mm -hmm. for temperature and then average temperature is good to know but it's also good to know the average high the average low um, median temperature or like average temperature isn't all that useful um, as just a pure number right like a place might have an average temperature of 40 degrees, but here in Ohio, 90 degrees is what we have in the summer. So um, those climate graphs, usually they're represented as bar graphs with sun. Yeah, they are. Yep. Then um, what about, uh, what about day length for your animals? 
Um, you have, you have a lot of different species. Um, are you recreating those cycles? I, I have tried, and I think it's I think it's more complicated, especially if you're keeping multiple species in one room. Yeah, because Very hard. I've tried using you know timers for my lights. You know, thinking when the light goes out, the turtle is going to think it's closing in on nighttime, but there's a window in the room. And even with the shades drawn, even with that little bit of light coming through the shades, it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't fool them. The timers don't fool them. They, they, I've noticed they just seem to know, like I try to delay brumation of a box turtle in, in the fall. It, mm. And as long as there's a the little bit of light coming in around the shades in that window, I can't fool them. They know. And I don't know. It'd be something to research to completely black that light, that window out mm -hmm. and see, is it actually the light coming around the, you know, the shades or do they just know, like, do they have an internal clock that says, Hey, you know, I think it's probably like October, November. I'm going to dig down and go to sleep for a while, you know? Yeah. Yeah just it's imprinted or they just know it. it's in their dna coded uh padrick is uh padrick do you have any gopher tortoises where you live in alabama or are you far north of them um yep gopher tortoises too they come out in the morning they come out in the evening and i mean this is so true i don't know if you've ever been down there uh phil to florida and seen gopher tortoises you ever seen them I've never seen them. That that's definitely a bucket list item. It's so easy to go to the places where they live and see them. Um, what I've been told, what happens is that you know because wetlands are protected more than uplands, and gopher tortoise habitat isn't you know it's dry, so it's not a wetland. A lot of times they get relocated if there's construction projects, and they'll. A lot of them will get relocated to the same places, so there's like these really high densities. But man, um, you if you go to a place where gopher tortoises are, like either if it's if it rains and then the sun comes out, just like box turtles, you go out. I mean, they're like everywhere, and you can just watch them mow down. <laughs> like literally, they'll bob their heads like down the path, just mowing the grass. It looks like someone's mowing the grass. They're under cars. There's signs where you have to, like, you go to the beach and you have to check underneath your car. Um, wow. To, to see if a gopher tortoise um, is there. But, um, yeah, no, you know, if you, like, stay, uh, if you spend an hour at the beach um, and they live right on beaches in the dunes, um, you know, you'll, you'll get there in the morning. You'll see them. They'll be out. Then at midday, you don't see them anymore. And then six o'clock seven o'clock at night they come back out start eating um padrick says uh let's see here about some but one of the uh he's he's not in gopher tortoise country but one of the auburn university researchers in the 80s was a friend of mine and he had two pair here in auburn and he uses uh, he used to talk about his research, so that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. I um, I saw a gopher tortoise once in a pet store in Akron, Ohio, uh, when I was about 12 years old. And uh, uh, it was quite the sight. I remember it just being there, and I, I was, it was, I was just kind of getting into reptiles, and you know, I had, I suspected that it probably wasn't legal, but I mean, it was a adult full-grown gopher tortoise was it just like the shop pet or was it for sale it was a shop that i didn't go to often and i don't remember mm -hmm. i think i remember going in there and saying like i like tortoises and they're like well look at this one <laughs> and i mean that thing it was dark it was it was an old animal old animal um yeah any other projects or uh stuff you want to chat about phil before we sign off for the night? Um, I, you know, I just, I'd like to go back uh, uh, to one of the things that we were talking about, the, the lighting. And yeah. um, I, I think you, you mentioned it, that, you know, these lights that we provide 
do they really provide everything that the, uh, an animal would get from natural sunlight? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think the answer obviously is no, yeah. uh, because I have tried, um, you know, taking some young turtles of the same species, same clutch, raise some of them where they weren't outside full time, but they had access to the sun on a regular basis. And some that didn't have access to the sun, they just had the artificial lighting. And there's kind of a dramatic difference there between the color development uh, on the shells and on the skin. The, the turtles that had access to natural sunlight are much brighter, uh, wow. darker, darker uh, colors, a darker saturation of the colors, I should say. So if it was the yellow or the red or the orange, you know, colors on a shell or, or uh, along the front of the leg, the scales in the front of the legs, the, the ones that had access to, to real sunlight definitely were more colorful. And that's, that's part of my whole like um, uh, dream to, to be able to get, if a turtle can live outside year round in my, in my climate, I want to have them outside. Um, I think it's just, you know, going to be better, overall for the turtle not only how they look but also their their health their hormone development and um, who knows what kind of things natural sunlight are doing for these animals that we haven't even you know researched or dreamed up yet absolutely well thank you very much phil it was a great chatting with you great catching up and thanks everyone in the chat um we do this every thursday night at 8 p.m we talk turtles uh, specifically, we talk a lot about caring for turtles and tortoises, how we do it, um, what to do, what not to do, and we all love turtles. Padraig is saying that his redfoots get redder and have darker shells when they are outside and they fade over winter inside. That's really interesting. Um, so next week, we are going to have... My friend, uh, turtle keeper, butterfly enthusiast, uh, uh, he works with ringed pythons, um, Paul Bodner is his name. Uh, he is, uh, he works with crocodiles. Um, if, if you're friends with Paul on Facebook, you'll see he travels all around the world, uh, seeing really interesting animals. And uh, I've gotten to know him uh, since I moved to Northeast Ohio. And so Paul is going to join us. And we're just going to talk about all the cool stuff Paul does and Paul sees, um, including uh, working with some radiated tortoises he works with. Um, yeah. And uh, ringed pythons, which is quite a rare species. So he has some really cool stuff. So that's the plan for next week. Phil? Phil? Thanks so much for joining me. Uh, everyone in the chat, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it, and we'll keep doing this. Talk to the turtles. Um, appreciate you being here. So thanks, everyone. Have a great evening.